No? How about now? How about if we start over? <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming to the menu. This is the last one for the season. Yay! So super excited. Um, we have Chef Gary Edwards here, but before I go ahead and introduce his team, um, I just have a couple of real quick thank yous to get out there. Um, I want to thank, on behalf of the Board of Directors and Deb Peterson, who's not with us this evening, she's away at a conference, so I'm sure she's bummed out that she's missing this one. Um, definitely want to say thank you to our major season presenting sponsor, which is Toyota of Scranton. Our season premiere sponsor, who is new this season, well, actually new and will be new next season, is UGL, United Gills Night Laboratories. Our Fidelity box office sponsor is Fidelity Bank. And our menu sponsor this season had been uh, McGrill, Mergle, and Quinn, our, our friends at the accounting firm. We want to give, right? So, yeah, this is the last one of the season, and we were talking a little bit earlier that we looked out the window, and what's that? Light. <laughs> we haven't seen that yet at this show, right? So, that's, that's, uh, that's, we know spring has sprung, I think, right? Yeah. I see Michael Gilmartin is in the house. Yay. And he's going to chime in on the conversation, hoping, hoping that you're going to have some company. Elaine will be here, too. Good. Um, very special thank you to Mark Migliori from ECTV. He is taping this and will be rebroadcasting it on ECTV, so we'll be seeing lots of repeats um, as the month progresses, and well, actually all year long. So without further ado, we've got our friends from Fire and Ice on Toby Creek. Who has been there? Oh, it's amazing. It is amazing. I live there. <laughs> he lives there. <laughs> Chef Gary Edwards and Ethan. you have help today. Yeah. Chef Ethan? Yep. Sue mm. Chefy. Mm. Okay, good. And I'm not really sure what you're going to be serving up, so I'm going to turn it over to you and you can... Well, you mean I have to know what's going on here? Yeah. Oh, jeez. You're well, killing finally. me. Well, oh. <laughs> finally. Hi, I'm Gary Edwards of Fire and Ice on Toby Creek and my son Ethan. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I love coming to the Cultural Center, and when I come here, I just think about the beauty and the art, and you know, things are, you know, so magical and so real when you look into the details. Uh, just looking up at that uh, artwork and really noticing, you know, what's around us. Uh, paying attention to our, the details. Uh, and I, I take that into my food. I, I look at like the little things in cooking. Uh, I used to do uh, cooking classes when I was at the Radisson Lackawanna Station Hotel in Scranton. Uh, and I would bring all the customers back into the kitchen. And I would usually do about 15 or 20 people and I would bring them back. And what I would always talk about is not the big things, it's always the little things. It's always the little things that you put into your food that makes it special. And for me, being a chef, there's nothing more rewarding because I touch the lives of everybody every day, whether it's a wedding or or a funeral launch, or you know, a baptism, or just coming out to eat. You know, my world is centered around people having a good time and eating. So I can touch everybody with my food. Um, I enjoy coming to the Cultural Center here and doing things like this. We've done uh, a lot of different events. I've been doing the evening of fine food and wine, which I know that I was asked to talk about We're that. Be Maybe talking we'll about talk that about it a little later. As well. I think it's yep. been what 17 or 18 years. 18. 18. Yep. I've been doing. I did it I, the first year it started. I was the, the chef at the uh, Raya House at the time, uh, and we set off the fire alarms that day with the smoke because <laughs> you know they didn't expect me to be all crazy with the uh, you know the flames and everything like that. And we've learned, and uh, so we, we, had, we, had a real we turned the alarm bit. system off that night or at least mute it so that the, uh, the fire department doesn't come and uh, <laughs> knock on the doors and uh, get mad. Um, so tonight we're going to be making a, uh, we're going to do an Asian French fusion dish. Uh, it's just kind of something I came up with in the last minute. Um, we're doing the exact same thing that uh, I did last night. We had, a, we had 20, and I just want to take a second to talk about it because I think it's really important for tonight's demo. Uh, we did, uh, we had a farm to table uh, uh, event at the Radisson last night. We were talking about having it here where there were some different dates that uh, we couldn't get the date. Um, but we, this benefit was, I don't the mean benefit, to yeah. the benefit was amazing. Like, why you did this it was like truly really, amazing. There was so much energy. We had 25, 27 chefs that came together. We had a local farm that produces uh, poultry and, and the, this is we're going to talk about the demo is why is it's important to you know to stay within the seasons and health. Um, but we had a local farm that was having some financial problems. Uh, you know farming industry just like the food industry. I mean it's tough. Uh, you know they are and we are all on the same page. We all work together to do the same thing. You know whether you're a farmer or you're a chef. 
we're still feeding people. Uh, and we still work really hard and it's still a you know, thankless job in a lot of different ways. Right. Uh, and they're out there trying to you know, make things happen. And the, we found out there was a Quails or Us farm that their, their business was not probably going to make it and they were probably going to go for foreclosure. And we had 27 chefs get together yesterday. We raised, th raised $35,000 for them. Uh, the and it was, right? it was from the community. We, have, uh, we had a seven uh, sh dream chef uh, a, a bid auction uh, that seven chefs are going to go to somebody's home and we were able to raise $2,000 on that alone of the high bidder. So somebody paid $2,000 for us to come and cook. So it shows how much, uh, you know, how important this is uh, to us as humans. And, uh, you know, you won't hear me stop talking about it enough how important I think food is. And of course, if I'm a chef and I don't think food is important, then I guess I'm not a very good chef. Um, you know, it's just kind of, you know, one in one. But it's not just food. It's, it's really about finding the right food source. I go back, and I'm again. I've been doing this for 20 some years, and you know, and it's not. It's a very tiny period of history. And I look at the uh, how our bodies are changing, and how uh, even our uh, produce is changing. You know, strawberries. We get Here, strawberries. You know how my body is changing, and yeah. it's not for the better. Well, I tell you what, we are what we eat, and what we put into our body is really important. You know, and I think that that's kind of like my theme here is you know, you know, e eating not to excess. Uh, you know, and you know, not going down the street of the corporate farmed foods. We're not going down the street of you know General Mills. Uh, you know, and I don't want to bash any corporations here, but you know, I mean, we're really not eating well as a, as a society, especially in this country. Sometimes it's not even how much we eat; it's it's what we eat. Absolutely, like processed food is bad. Yeah, I mean, we're getting pushed a lot of stuff. So finding alternate sources, and it's crazy to say alternate sources of food, but really, this is our source. This is the season of meat, and I know. Some people are into vegetarianism, and I love vegetarian. I've been a ve I've been a vegan uh, myself just for health. I really like to uh, enjoy good fresh, fresh vegetables. Um, but you know, in, as far as our history as humans goes, uh, you know, this is the time where we've gone through the winter. You know, and the only food that may have been available all winter is, and especially in the spring, is the livestock that we've had outside or in the in the barn, or maybe you know the the fowl that was out in the woods. You know, because the root cellar is empty at this point. You know, and there's certainly refrigeration and, and preservation of food uh, doesn't lend itself for us to have the types of food that we have today. Um, you know, so I think it's important to, you know, for our body, I, I think it's important that we fast once in a while. I think it's really important. I think that, you know, as a society, we say fast for two or three days. It's for a health benefit. Our body should shut down and reset a couple days. Uh, we should eat lots of fruits and vegetables in the summertime, have lots of salads, you know, and have good farmed, good quality meats. And I'm not talking about farm factory. I'm talking about real food food that is, you know, walking around, eating a, a healthy diet, you know, and it's the springtime, it's time for rebirth, you know, as the, as the, as the, you know, the baby lambs are being born, it's time for, you know, changing the, changing the crops out, uh, and, uh, you know, quite often, this stew season, I look at, I look at the spring as stew season, uh, where you, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit chilly out, and you could put a pot of stew on the stove, and you can go out for a little walk, and come back in two or three hours, you know, and you have your beans, and you have everything there and you just, you know, it's time to get ready to get the, you know, the outside together and it's still a little chilly. So to me, and I think that that's important to stay within the season. Um, just to talk back about the farm benefit a little bit, um, you know, we, you know, we're going to be doing this every year. Uh, we plan on starting a coalition to help uh, different farms that are in need and uh, show community support by, you know, chefs getting involved and saying, hey, this is what food's all about. You know, and again, in the spring, you know, we had, uh, we had four Berkshire hogs that were uh, a, a generous uh, gentleman donated and bought and spent four thousand wow. dollars on, on sending us good farmed Berkshire hogs which that's the leg of the hog there and we're gonna we're gonna make a seafood ca or I'm sorry a, a French cassoulet uh, tonight and we're gonna do a uh, which a cassoulet is a vessel it's a French vessel which we would get the word casserole from so the cassoulet would be the vessel that you would serve the casserole in just like a paella the dish is the paella is the pan that you cook it in so we're going to be doing a cassoulet and I'm not necessarily doing it exactly in the, the casserole dish uh, I'm doing it in a cast iron pan uh, I like to cook cast iron I tell the story often when I'm doing the cooking and demos at the evening and fine food and wine. Um, I, I 
personally, um, my mom, uh, she's passed, and uh, she always cooked in a cast iron pan, and it really means a lot to me to, you know, make a lot of food in the cast iron. I think that uh, there's nutrients in there, uh, and for me, it, it's kind of dear, so whenever I have a chance, I use cast iron to do my demonstrations. It's a, it's a fun, it's a fun. It is fun. Yeah. It's a fun vessel. So, uh, as I was saying, our, our menu tonight, we're going to be doing a French uh, cassoulet. We're going to do an Asian twist on it. We're going to do a wonton, uh, working with another local goat farmer. Uh, I get goat's milk and we make goat's cheese, which is like a really creamy ricotta type cheese. Uh, and then that is with uh, fresh farmed from Roland's farm arugula, which was some of the folks that helped us out with the uh, dinner last night. So we're talking about really fresh arugula, uh, chopped up, and a nice goat cheese filling in our wonton. And the whole idea there is to have something a little bit light to kind of play off of the heavier stew. Uh, the beans, generally the cassoulet is going to have beans in it. Uh, we're using a Christmas bean. These are really good organic beans that I would use in the restaurant. Um, and oh, actually, what are they called? They're, it's a Christmas blend. And it's just a blend, it's, it's, but it's heirloom organic beans. Uh, again, getting back to, even though it's beans, I think it's, it's important to find quality. So we're going to get an heirloom organic bean. I have a friend of mine who's a doctor, uh, and he, he's a doctor so that he can afford to have his farm, so that he can farm and have his equipment, so that he can make beans, and he can s collect uh, solar energy, and he can raise chickens and stuff like that, because he's really into health. And guess what? He and I are good friends because of that commonality. Right. You know? So I think it's important. I think it'd be so cool to be off the grid completely, don't you? I think so. I, I do. I think that's where I we. I think Jackson humans. Jackson Brown is I think like humans kind of should there, should you know uh, you should have Brown that is. connection, and yeah. they should uh, you know uh, be able to be connected and and know you know what the weather's like and know what you're doing today based on the weather versus you know sitting on the phone with your head down putting buttons right. and and loading <laughs> loading loading. I can't stand it. I look at the phone. It's loading. I'm loading. I'm wasting my <laughs> life by loading. You know. I throw the phone away. I don't need it. <laughs> so. Jeff, real quick question. Sure. How important is it um, the the food Foods that the animals eat mm -hmm. and that are fed. How sure. important is that? Well, again, you are what you eat, so the animals are what they eat. You know, so when we're taking chickens, and I don't want to get into. Uh, I mean, I when I went to this Culinary Institute of America in uh, Hyde Park, and uh, one of the classes, of course, we were talking about food and we were talking about meats. And one of the things that I learned about the poultry industry is something that's really terrible. You know, and I'm talking about farmed food. You know, yeah. uh, um, factory farmed food, rather. Sorry. Um, you know, where you know chickens. You know. A lot of these chickens can't even stand up in their cages. They're 20 or 30 high, yeah. and they're packed into these pins. You know, and that's not, you know, that's not good. You know, when you treat, any, I think anything, everything should be treated with reverence. Uh, my favorite uh, chef is Auguste Escoffier, uh, and one of his, uh, you know, sayings was about the simplest things done um, perfectly is just that. You know, you, you use it, and if God has given us all these gifts, who are we to not use it? You know, and that's, and, and that's uh, I don't have the quote memorized exactly, but, uh, you know, basically, if God has given us all this glory, why are we not able to right. use it to its fullest? Right. You know, and Instead so. Of abusing it. Yeah. So, right. again, what we put into it, and, you know, if we are putting all these chemicals into our food and we're ingesting this food, it's in us. You know, so the growth hormones, the antibiotics, all this stuff, you know, and or even the sprays on the vegetables, you know. The vegetables are really in bad shape too, you know, unless you get real good or organic and heirloom and you grow it yourself. You know, it's a crapshoot of what you're getting there too. Hey. Yeah, right. so uh, Sorry, we're going to start in the demo you. here. Uh, we're going to do a meat stew. We're going to start with some fresh duck. And I'm going to break that down really quick. That's, actually, that's a fresh duck, all right. He is fresh. Well, he, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's not talking too much today. He's quiet. <laughs> he's not going to say a whole now, lot. Is, is that from a local farm? Uh, this, unfortunately, is not. I was not able to get it. But if I could, I would. Okay. So breaking down a, chuck, a duck is very similar to a chicken. Uh, you have the keel. You're going to go right down either side of the keel. And you do have the wishbone here that you have to watch for, or you're going to... Not on the camera. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You there might have to, there you yeah, go. There we go. All right. Thank you. It's Thank always you. good to let us know. Yeah. So uh, we're going to go down the keel here, and we're going to cut through the wishbone. We're going to cut around it. I can't. I can't and watch. Cutting, cutting meats, my son Ethan and I, we like to uh, work in the kitchen a lot, right, buddy? What kind of stuff do we like to do uh, when, we're, uh, when, we're, when we're out hunting? Venison. We love venison. We always put about four deer in the freezer, don't we? Yep. And what did we? What else did we make this year with the venison? We made some sausage and kibasi. Wow. And hot dogs, fresh hot dogs with nitrate-free bacon. And so you know, we eat hot dogs, but we eat healthy hot dogs, right? Yep. Because we don't want all that stuff in our body. How do the neighbors so, like all that? I don't care about the neighbors. <laughs> 
sorry, I have a fence. <laughs> you don't care about it. Yeah, I, I have a fence, you know. I'm a good neighbor. Good, good neighbors oh, have I'm fences, sure. they say, right? <laughs> so we're just going to dice up our meats here. Now, these are all going to cook in different stages. And, you know, in all reality, I don't want to take too much time here because, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to cut up some of the breast. For those of us that like duck, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one, because I like all food. Mm -hmm. um, so it said that uh, the, the duck is like a fattier piece of meat. It absolutely okay. is. Yep. So mm -hmm. should we be concerned about that? I mean, well, I mean, it depends on what you're concerned on. I mean, some people are concerned, they, you know, they, they drink diet soda and uh, eat a Big Mac, you know, so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I mean, what, what do you, what do you, I mean, a little bit of good fat, uh, I think is good. I think a little bit of butter is good, you know. Uh, one of the classes that I had at the Culinary Institute of America was healthy cuisine, and they did use butter, uh, and they didn't use margarine because they thought, you know, if people eat margarine, it, it's going it's to suck, yeah. and they're not going to want to eat it. So, you know, you might as well use a little bit of butter and some olive oil and make it taste good. So that we're going to give it to you straightforward today. Yeah, we're going to give it to you forward. I'm <laughs> There's sorry. There's no holding back. No holding back. But no, I agree So we want that. our food to taste good, so we might as well, you know, eat in moderation right. and not try to mask it up. Yeah, because then you're just not going to want to eat it anyway. That's right. my point, really. You know? I really, I love olive oil. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I have really gotten away from using butter um, mm -hmm. for like just normal. Like or I'm, just a little bit, you know, yeah. just a little bit of uh, butter on the toast, you know, rather than, you know, slopping it up. So this is Berkshire. Uh, different breed. Uh, All together, it comes from uh, Berkshire, uh, England, which is the same breed as the Japanese black hog. Uh, so it's an actual different, complete different breed of animal. Um, and uh, it's of superior quality. And uh, it's just, you know, genetically speaking, uh, a, a totally different animal completely than your, your standard American hog. Okay, uh, you're starting to see a lot more of these in the United States. Okay, and uh, and again, I'm going to just take a little bit of this. I'm going to take some of the shank meat here, just for our stew. We don't need a whole lot. I'm just kind of demonstrating and showing you, you know, the difference of this this meat. This is not that white, uh, pale meat that you might see uh, when you're in the supermarket. Right. Uh, you know, this is a nice, rich uh, cut of meat here, and I just kind of want to show you how beautiful this is. I think your you know, knives are beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Knives are important. They're your tools, <laughs> they right? They are. It's so funny because um, we have some guests in the audience that are regulars. Well, there's a lot of us here that are regulars, right? Because this mm -hmm. is such a fun show. Um, but they, we were talking earlier on, and she said, this is costing me a lot of money to come to this show because we always end up buying a new gadget. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm looking here, and I can't tell the difference between the pork and the duck, and that's, that says a lot that's, for this animal. Wow. I mean, wow, you know what yeah. I mean? You're, you're, they're both very similar looking. So, you know, we're just going to chop this up. And again, we're making a stew here. So, Chef, while you're working, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about Evening of Fine Food and Wine and how that works. Um, Evening of Fine Food and Wine is going to be the 18th year on Sunday, April 29th. So make sure you mark your calendars. I think that we have a couple of folks that bought tickets today. Yay, thank you so much. Um, it is one of our major, it's our major fundraiser for the season, the spring season. We have two major fundraisers, one in the fall, one in the spring. And Evening of Fine Food and Wine happens to be ours. Our, our chair, our honorary chairperson is in the house, Elaine Shepard. And, oh, okay. The, oh, John and Elaine Murray are here. Or John and, yeah. I can't see. I can't hear, see from here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. But anyway, it is such a fun event. We've been doing this year after year. It's a, um, it's a food and wine experience, but you also get to experience the entire building. So, um, Chef, what room are you in? I'm on the fourth floor. Okay. They always Shopping give me my own Hall. room, Chaplin Hall. Okay. Yep. So we have five entrees set up in five different glorious rooms. And we break up into five different groups, start off in the ballroom, and then we rotate throughout the whole night. So everyone gets to sample the chef that has to be, that's housed in each of the rooms. Mm -hmm. And um, we run it similar to this. I do like a whole cooking demo a whole and cooking talk demo. about, I think yep. I'm going to be doing oxtail ragu Ooh, for that. Because I, I did that for a I think we're getting a sneak preview sneak here. Sneak preview. You know, I'm <laughs> going to do either spatzel or uh, pasta. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> oh, hi. How you doing? <laughs> See, now you'll know, so you won't have to bug me to get my menu in, right? Because <laughs> I know how I am, right? <laughs> or actually, you know how I am. I'm terrible. You know, chefs, sir, we're, we're crazy. We have a lot of stuff going on, and we have a hard time with computers and stuff like that. Oh, okay. I see John and Elizabeth. Hi. I'm sorry. 
The Marie's are here. Oh, excellent. So uh, again, we're prepping our vegetables. Uh, you know, nothing too special here. We're just gonna dice um, our carrots. And then maybe Ethan can do a little bit of celery here. I did not know Ethan was your son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, we work together. Like I said, we, we've spent so many hours in the kitchen, um, you know, cutting up, uh, a lot of times cutting up venison, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the best thing at the end of the night around midnight when we're done cutting the venison? Backstrap. Backstrap, yeah. We have a little so bit of So you backstrap. enjoy this, Ethan? How long yeah. have you been doing it? Uh, probably about seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We had, we We've had him out young. I'm gonna watch the child labor people here. I'm gonna throw me in jail, but you know, you better watch. You better say that quietly. You're gonna, gonna be, you know, feed you from the prison system here. You know. So, I'm going to brown the meat, and Ethan's gonna cut up a little bit of celery here over here, if you don't mind, buddy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use a little bit of uh, duck fat. I have to be careful because of the smoke point on this. Um, in fact, I'm going to start with the meat first, just so I, because I don't want it to get too hot and burn, because I know that, that these burns are a little touchy here. So now there's no oil or anything. No, I don't need oil. Because, you know, I'm, I'm well, I, actually, I would have normally added this, but I, I kept it a little bit separate because I didn't want it to burn and smoke. See that? I wanted to get the meat there and start cooling it down. So now we have two things going on here. We have mallard reaction. And how ironic that we have mallard reaction with duck, right? Come on, tough crowd. <laughs> mallard reaction, duck, That's please. Funny. It was funny. Either they're sleeping or I'm boring, I don't know. We, so we have mallard reaction. Mallard reaction is the browning of meat. Some people talk about you put the meat in the pan and you're caramelizing the meat. Caramelization happens with sugar. Mallard reaction happens with proteins when they coagulate and brown. So, you know, not to say people don't know what they're talking about, when, but when people talk about, you know, caramelizing meat, there are technically some sugars in there, so they're not 100% wrong, but when you really, uh, to be correct, you would be talking about mallard reaction. So just to clarify, which is the browning of meat. it does not have to be a mallard duck. It does not, no. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a pun. Some people got it, but most people didn't. <laughs> You got it, though. You're, 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 well, I'm, we'll okay. feed you tonight. There's a backstory there now, too. I happen to live with an environmentalist who's okay. the steward of the Lackawanna River, which mallard, mallard ducks galore. Sure. Okay? Absolutely, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's so, a lot of wonderful artists in the area that have painted them or photographed. They're just beautiful. They're a beautiful animal. So keep the demo moving here. Um, I, I would put a little bit of leek in there, but I have to like peel that down and wash it. So, you know, I think I'm gonna skip over that. I'll talk about the leek though. Um, and I'll also talk about the fact that I'm using like five different onions here. Um, and um, I, I think it's important to layer flavors. Uh, just like an artist might use their, um, their easel or their paint uh, board to mix colors. Uh, you know, I think just using an onion is just like using a color of red. Why use a color of red when you can put a little bit of orange or a little bit of yellow or a little bit of, you know, purple into it. So, you know, when I'm layering flavors of food, I generally will do, I mean, sometimes I do one type of onion, but a lot of times I'll do a little bit of onion, some leek, some scallion, some shallot, you know, because these are all building blocks of flavors. And, you know, I think these things matter. What I talked about in the beginning is the little things matter in cooking. So, you know, having like different layers of onions. And again, it's like talking to a, a painter, you know, um, does he know what color he's going to do or does he know what he's going to, uh, how he's going to do it? Probably not until he's into it. Right. And then a lot of times that's the love that you taste when you say, oh, this tastes really good. Why? Well, it's the little things that went into it, not the big things. Anybody could take something, throw it in a pan, open up the oven door and come back an hour later and say, oh, it's done. Who's eating it, right? You know, it's the little things that you put into it. The, the, you know, the, the salt and the pepper. You want to salt, you want to salt your meats right in the beginning so that it, the, the salt goes into the meat and not at the end because now you're salting the end of the meat and then you're not going to get any flavor on the you inside of it. In there, yeah, right? it's like cooking pasta. You know, you, you cook pasta, you toss it in salt. No, you, you boil it in salted water so that it absorbs some of the salt. So every time we do a cooking demo, I, and, and I think those of you that come on a regular basis know that I always have that aha moment. There's that one thing that I learned and it's this tonight. I never, I, I never, I always ask myself, oh, should I use a couple different kinds of onions mm -hmm. or should I just stick with the same one because the recipe in my head. I mean, there's I don't no follow recipes. right or wrong. I love right. when people are like, well, the recipe said, well, what's the hell's a recipe? That's a yeah. piece of paper that somebody else wrote. Well, these are recipes in my head. Well, no, that's fine. I, that's I, good. And yeah, I so you, you want to use a medallion and that. Sure, and not, nothing else? So what was that one, the first uh, one? That was just some white onion. White, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then uh, in, in the stew that we're going to be uh, serving, uh, we do have leek, we do have shallot. 
A shallot is in the onion family, uh, and it's a cross between onion and garlic as far as flavor I goes. I love shallot. Oh, the shallot. Right, buddy? Yep. So what do we got going over here? We need to pick some of this thyme, if you don't mind, for me. We're going to finish that with some fresh thyme. You want to help me out there, fun? My sous chef. Keeping them busy. So we're going to put a little shallot in there. And again, we're not going to cook this all the way in the back. This is going to take, you know, good two or three hours to cook. Um, but essentially, you're just making a stew, and you're going to braise this down, and we're going to make the meat nice and tender. Okay. So you got all these nice no, flavors. No you know, if you want to, you can get some wine and put some wine in here. You can get some wine and put some wine Did in your belly. Wine? It could be home eating. <laughs> Have a little wine for me, a little wine for the stew. You know, but so what, what would you uh, would you use a blanc? In you that? could go. You can go two sides of the street here. You can go white or you can go red. You know, I might go down the white street here because of the the lightness right, of the pork right. and the duck. But you could go. You know, but if you add the, the tannins of the red, it might change it and make it a real rich sauce. But me personally, I would probably go white wine in this. But you know, there's no real rule to that either. Some people, you know, do you like what red wine with chicken? If you like it, then that's what you like. See, I like that because you like I that? don't like to play by rules. Yeah, I don't like rules. I think it goes by however you When I was in school, I, that my, my principals, you know, they knew <laughs> I was never going to be the guy that plays by the rules. Well, a lot of folks will say, oh, does this pair better with the red or pair better with the white? I used to do some work with um, iGourmet.com and, and talking cheeses. And I would always say to people, I don't play by the rules, so this sort of cheese could go either way. Like a, like a grana padano, we were talking about grana padano earlier. Um, I mean, of course, that'll go really well with any Italian dish, and you can grate it in a nice red sauce, and goes beautiful with a, a, a nice hearty red wine, a, a nice full-bodied red. But then you could take that same grana padano after dinner, drizzle some honey over it, and it becomes a little dessert, and you can have it with Prosecco. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole different experience. Absolutely. And food is fun. Um, this time of year, I love when I see spring onions um, because I love spring onions um, because they are, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're the first onions that you're going to eat. And they're the baby onions and they have a nice flavor. So again, talking about layering flavors, here comes another onion. Gary's throwing spring onions in his food. And but, that's just a spring onion. Mm -hmm, yep. They're boiling onions. No, so but boy, good. I love these onions. They're nice and sweet. They're delicious. They're one of my favorite onions. And you usually just see them this time of year, just like when you see figs around Christmas time. You know, that's what you should be eating is figs around Christmas time. <laughs> not in the summertime. You should be eating tomatoes in the summertime. And Chef, I love if somebody tomatoes. is not comfortable cutting off a duck from the whole... Could you buy it in part? You know, I always get asked questions about buying food and this and that. And my world, I know, is totally different than most people, you know. Uh, and I know some of the supermarkets do some local butchering. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, in fact, i give a little plug. My business partner, Joe Fasula, he has Garrity Supermarket. Uh, and they do a lot of custom cuts of meats. Right. Do I know if they carry duck? I don't want to get in trouble and say they do. I don't know if they do or if they can get it in. I know his meat manager is very good at being accommodating and helping, you know, get foods for different people. So, you know, sometimes a phone call, they'll get that personal touch and say, hey, you know, I'm looking to get this next week. Can you get it in? And sometimes, you know, you, you might uh, get lucky that way. I think, too, with Garrity's. We love Garrity's because they're a great partner of ours. And as a matter of fact, Garrity's did the menu a couple of months ago. I think it was uh, the month before last. But um, I know my mom does this all the time. She'll call the butcher and ask, you know, can you prepare this or, you know, cut up this. And they'll do it if you call them. I think Elaine has a question. I do. Are, are you on? I don't know. I can't. Can you? There you go. I just want to make sure that everybody can smell how good that is. You know, it's a wonderful aroma. Could you yeah. smell how good that, that is yeah. back yeah. there? Well, it's on amazing. television you can't, but you know, they should have a little sensor in the TV that when you're sitting there, you get a waft of the food, <laughs> put a little fan, like when you're sitting yeah. at home and you're like, ooh, and you know, that Debbie okay. gloss is good. If you want to come up and walk, you know, you huh? can come up and walk yeah. by. Well, you really, you what should. you're smelling mm. is a lot of it is anybody, I don't know, can you see that on the, on the camera Bring there? Bring it up to the lens. Uh, can you see it there? D don't burn your sun, though. <laughs> He's okay. He's tough. <laughs> It'll toughen him up a little bit. Um, this is duck gloss. So, and I tell you what, if I had somebody, if I had, sometimes when I'm doing the cooking demos uh, at the evening of Fine Food and Wine, I'll take the gloss like this and I'll pass it around a little bit just so people can really appreciate what that smell, the flavor that's in that. That is gold that is right gold. there. That, that is. is gold. Yep. So, um, that's a duck so stock. Um, and... Um, we are going to use that as the liquid in our cassoulet. 
Uh, the cranberry beans, uh, I'm sorry, the Christmas bean, beans, they would normally be soaked overnight. Uh, you don't necessarily have to soak your beans, um, but it's a good idea. What it does is it helps uh, cut back on the gas. So, you know, what beans do to us? It does it to all of us. Oh, there's my... But if you I soak them, it does cut back. <laughs> yeah. If you soak your beans, it cuts back on that, um, the unpleasantries of the next Throw day. Throw away your, the your, beano. Your, yeah, your, your family and friends, they, uh, yeah, they don't like you. I did not know that. Yeah. So, for all intents and purposes, we're pretty much done here. I can add a, a couple of little extra layers of flavor to this if I want, which I think I'm going to, is put a little brandy in here. Easy killer. Easy killer. <laughs> that was kind of cool though, wasn't it? It was pretty cool. <laughs> and you see you the see smell? There? Did you get the smell difference on that? You catch that brandy? Totally. You're going to add like a little bit of different, uh, you know, texture or, or flavor to, the, to, the, uh, to our cassoulet. Speaking of brandy, has any, not that this has anything to do with margaritas, but um, has anybody tried our, our featured uh, cocktail this evening? We have the traditional and non-traditional margaritas. Um, our, our bar staff is awesome. Give it up me. for Brian. I thought I was going to get a sample. You are. Well, I think well, I need to get a sample and tell everybody how good well, it see, is. Now, now see how, see how well I worked myself a free margarita out of you? We had to work, <laughs> we had to work the fire in there first. We didn't want oh, to Oh, yeah. We don't want a toxicated chef to be uh, drinking margaritas. Um, so, essentially the cassoulet, we're going to put some liquid in there, we're going to cook it down, we're going to make a nice stew with the uh, Christmas beans, uh, and this is going to simmer. So at this point, I would get everything in there, I would put some water on it, I would go for a nice walk, go to the creek and enjoy this, you know, this cool spring day, and then nice. come back and have dinner. So, so simple, cool. really. You know, just get some nice fresh meat, some nice it fresh vegetables, and, and, and really work with what you have. Okay? Now, I think Elaine, you were saying that you like the... It is delicious. Thank there you. you go. And you have, which margarita do you have? Strawberry one. Oh. The strawberry one. That's the pink. We have a pink one and a, and a green one. That's what I know. I don't drink, I'm not a margarita. No, I like, I like, I like tequila. So we're going to make some sausage and we're going to, the reason I did sausage and we're going to have this going to be part of our, our dinner that we're going to have tonight uh, is, is again, I like to try to use the whole, uh, as much of the animal as I can or put it in different parts in the dish. So again, instead of just having the stew, I'm going to have a little sausage. Oh, I see a margarita. I knew one would come. <laughs> is, is that an umbrella? <laughs> it's no. a real one too. It's a it's real a one. one. <laughs> wow. It's a green one. Nice. See how hard that was? Thank you. The power of suggestion. The what? The law of attraction is set over there. So, um, making the sausage, this is coming, we, we're using the ham section of the pig, uh, and we're gonna make the sausage from the shoulder section. There's a lot more fat. Um, I didn't add any fat to this. Uh, when you have your sausage, it's gonna be a little bit drier. Um, I think that it's important to kind of stay with the animal, and it doesn't have to be. I, don't, I can emulsify some fat in there and make it like a, you know, a Frankfurt or something like that, but um, you know, I like to stay a little bit uh, more generic uh, with the flavors. So any sausage, especially an Italian flavor, fennel and pork go very well together. So I'm gonna use some dry fennel, some paprika. Anybody know what paprika is? Ethan, you know what paprika is? Mm -hmm. What is it, buddy? Uh, I'm not sure where it comes from, but it's a nice spice to add to sausage. It is a nice spice. Spain? Yep. Um, generally from Spain, uh, and it is the, uh, the, the um, dehydrated red pepper. Okay? So what else are we going to put in here, buddy? We're going to put some garlic, right? Some salt and some pepper. Chef, if you don't mind, while you're mixing that up, I'm going, it's time for us to do our raffle. We have an event sure. that's coming up that's really super fun. Um, I don't know if you've seen the advertising or the flyers that were on the marketing table, but we have um, Connection Beyond Live, and she's so a medium. Uh, Marissa Liza Pell, who's actually a Scranton native, is going to come and take us uh, on that journey on May 5th. So we're going to be giving away a pair of tickets to that. And if Elaine would be so kind as to help me out and pull a name, I can come down. Thank you. Oh, this is so funny. Let's, let's guess who it is. Elaine. It's Frank Padula. <laughs> that's so awesome because they come all the time. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. You're going to come to see Marissa Liza Pell. That's so cool. Thank you, Elaine. The uh, margarita is very good. Nice going, Brian. 
Good job, buddy. We have a, um, a weekly music event. It's a live music, and, and we're super proud of it because it's like bringing in a whole lot of uh, very interesting, very talented artists. Every Tuesday, it's called Underground Microphone, and we call it that because we have it downstairs in the lower level in the hood room. We've had, I can't even tell you the talent that comes in those doors, they're just amazing. So we open up um, every Tuesday, doors open at 5, 5.30, the entertainment gets started around 6. It's not an, it's not an open mic because the acts are um, pre-scheduled uh, in advance, but we have poets, comedians, wonderful musicians, and um, so if you're, you know, if you find yourself looking for something to do on a Tuesday evening after work, please by all means stop on down. Awesome. Yeah, it's cool. So um, thanks for the break and the phew, good. Margarita was good. Good have Margarita. To have a couple of them. By the end of the show, I'll be like, what is he talking about? Well, I guess we started that way, right? So <laughs> okay, how bad can it get, right? <laughs> so that's why I brought up the underground mic, because Brian, our bartender, is our steady bartender for oh. down there. And he's, he's so into this. Yeah. Stuff. And again, it's, you know, I always give a, a lot of homage to, uh, you know, to bartenders, because they're, they're cooking without heat. That's really, they're, you know, they're artists. And they're, yeah. they're, you know, they're peeling their fr fruits and vegetables. And, you know, I'm, I'm into good alcohol, too. I mean, or good drinks, you know, alcohol doesn't hurt. <laughs> So, no, you know what I mean? Like, you know, fresh yeah. squeezed juice and, you know, uh, stuff like that. Um, so, for the sausage casings, a little trick that I learned is to, to make like a little loop here. And you can kind of run the, the water right through. These are natural intestines. You want to know what's so funny, Chef? We what's had that? one of those in our basement. What's that? Okay, how many Italian households had one of those in their basement? <laughs> what, a, a We sausage? used to make sausage, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, this is, again, this is getting... Hot, this is, mild. And, you know, people get really nervous about this, but, it, you know, all you're doing is you don't even have to grind. If you have a KitchenAid, you have one of these attachments and, you know, spend a couple dollars. That's not a huge investment. Um, and you can even, if you don't want to grind it, you can grab... I, I like to do, uh, if I'm making burgers, you know, to get the fresh steak and just cut it up and... You know, nothing better than a fresh burger that you just ground 10 seconds ago. I mean, it's really, you know, 10 times better. Or even chop it up with a knife. So I don't have to do the whole thing here because we're going to take too long. I'm going to tie it off. And... And what kind of um, casings are those? Uh, these are sh um, pork casings. You do pork, sheep, depending on the size, you know, what, you, what you're looking for. And you don't want to tie. It's hard to tie with gloves on. Okay, you ready, big guy? All right, let's make I some sausage. I think the dishes are starting to make their way Pretty around. Cool. Yep. Nice. Yeah, if you want to try to start Thank sampling you. while I'm demoing, we have to get everybody fed, and uh, you know, you're going to get the end result. Here you go, buddy. Ready? Now, see how we're getting a little bit of air here? We don't really have to worry about that too much, because we can always poke that out, like with a little prick, or with a little, uh, uh, like a little knife. Show it right in there. Don't put your fingers in there. We don't want fingers in no, the sausage. No, no. We don't want fingers no in there. No They taste no terrible. Chopping. Little boy fingers are disgusting. <laughs> if they weren't, I'd be, you know, I'd be using them, but they, they don't taste good. Okay. I so can now, smell the fennel. Yeah, you know, when people get nervous about this stuff, and how hard is this? It's not really that hard, you know? I have two, uh, you know, I have two uh, older. Uh, John, you want oh, to we gotta blow out. That's good. All right, we're gonna stop. We gotta blow out here. Um, yeah, we've had times, you know, making yokis in the kitchen and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think it's really important for families to get together and work on, you know, food. So anyway, so we have our sausage here. Okay. I don't know, chef. Some families should not be together in the kitchen. I don't. I don't. No. I don't. I, don't agree with that. I think that. I think that really helps. You know. Uh, you know. Keep people together. I mean, how many you know stories do we have of sitting around picking the beans? You know. You know, with grandma making the you know, raviolis or making the pierogies or. You know. I mean, I think that's just really you know 101 on actually keeping the family as a nice. Uh, so anyway, yeah, it's just sausage. You know. And nothing to be scared of. If there's any holes here, you could poke a little, uh, if there's any air, you could poke a couple holes and, and just push it through and, and roast it. It's just a basic, simple sausage from really good meat. And that's, that's Hold the it point. Up to the camera. And they can see it okay. on the, and out in TV yeah. land. In TV yeah. land, okay. That look, that looks so right. we have our sausage and we're going to roast that nice and slowly. Um, for the demo, I roasted that in beer. Because why not? So that's going to be for our cracklings. We're using the pork belly. 
uh, which is the bacon part of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the pig, which is down here, which is really, that's what, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's mm -hmm. all about, is the belly. So, um, we're going to make our wontons that we have there. I don't have a clean cutting board. I'm just going to... Chef, I just took a bite of that sausage. It's amazing. Well, thank you. So, for our wontons, again, I'm going to have to take these off because I don't think that they're going to work well with the wontons. Again, wontons are pretty simple too. Um, they, these packs, you got, you know, I think I bought this at the store. It was $5 for about a gazillion of them. And, uh, you know, taking them and maybe, maybe I would take some of this sausage or that pork and make a nice fresh wonton and have it in a nice broth, you know. Um, I think, you know, homemade cooking is important. Um, and if you don't know how to do it, uh, it's important just to figure it out and learn. And then you know. And then if you, if you make a mistake, that's okay because now you know what not to do. And I think that's more important than doing nothing. You know, I think it's important to just try, so to go true. out and try to do food. I think, you know? a lot, I think sometimes we get afraid. Well, you know what, you what's know? to be afraid of? Failure. You that, right. When you fail, what do you, what do you, what do you gain from failure? You gain everything from failure, don't you? Right. I do, sure. right? You learn how to do when it you, right. When you crash your bike, what do you learn? Not to crash your bike. Right. You know? <laughs> so. The wontons, really simple. You could do it with um, egg wash, egg, or just water. Ethan, you want to show them how to do the wonton here, buddy? I was watching the Food Network at one point, and, um, well, at many points, um, and I forget what chef it was, but she was actually making ravioli using... Mm -hmm. the, the wontons? Wont yeah. Yeah, why not? So Ethan's moistening the edges, right, Ethan? Why are you, going to, why are you moistening the edges, buddy? So it uh, sticks to each other. Okay, good. And what are you going to do here now, buddy? Put the filling in. Okay. And our filling is fresh local goat's milk mm. uh, made into a uh, goat cheese. Uh, with fresh arugula. Okay. It's quiet in the room. It's I'm quiet. It must, the food must be okay, huh? How is it? Delicious. Is it good? Wow. Awesome. So now, Ethan, what are you doing here? Uh, folding it and then sticking the edges. Okay. And you want to press down. Why? So it sticks together so it doesn't bust. Very good. Good job. Now what are we going to do here, buddy? Going to fold it. Okay. And I see you got your finger in there. Is that a little trick that you learned? Awesome. So now how are you going to get your finger out? Watching. That's too cool. Good job. <laughs> Hold it up to the camera lens awesome. so you can see outside. Right That's a nice, beautiful wonton. Nice. Very good. Good job, buddy. I remember going back to college days. I was in Garmage and uh, we had a, we had a uh, class that we had to do. Uh, we had to cook something, and we all wanted the most uh, the coolest job. You know, we all wanted to smoke the salmon or make the mousse or uh, you know make the terrine. And and the chef called me up and he says, "Well, I want you to make tortellini salad." And I was like, "Oh man, I got the dumbest job ever. I got to make tortellini salad." I'm like, "Okay." So I ordered from the commissary, uh, you know, tortellinis. I'm like, "Well, I'm going to get tortellinis." And he says, "No, you're making pasta. You're making a filling, and you're making." Tortellini tortellinis for 300 people. If you're going to do it, you're going to do yeah, it. Yeah, right? and I went, oh boy, now I do have a big job, don't I? Like he says, yeah, you do have a big job. So I, at first I thought the chef was kind of like dissing me because he's going to give me the easiest job going. Because you know, you're in college, you want, you want the professor to give you that hard assignment, you know? And I'm like, oh, I want the hard assignment, you know? And he gave me like a oh, tortellini salad. And then I'm like, oh, I have to make those for 300 people? I got a big job here, don't I? Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like no problem. How do you figure, like what... When, when you're putting your ingredients together, mm -hmm. okay, so it's easy for us to try to put a dinner uh, party together for 20 or mm -hmm. Not for what? me. I have a hard time. It's easier for me to cook for 200. I'm used to it. Right. Yeah. You know, you get used yeah, to it. I and you know your people. Yeah, because yeah. you, you, you know do that every day. Well, yeah. and you know your family and friends. You know what to eat. If you're, you know, you're an Italian family and you're making sausage or you're making, you know, lasagna, you know, generally, you know, they're going to eat the heck out of this because they eat every right. Sunday and, you know, so. But is there an easy formula that There's you can? There's not. You know, there really isn't. It's kind of the love of it, you know. I mean, like even a bartender will tell you, sometimes they drink crazy and you're getting crazy busy and sometimes they just don't drink. You don't know. Do you make as you go? Well, you kind of do and you kind of get a feeling of, you know, uh, you know, enough and you know and then re repurposing food is, is a good thing too you might take this cassoulet you know and make another dish out of it you know maybe you know or maybe if you have the stew you know and you eat it and you're like oh we had stew and I'll throw some tomato sauce on it and cook it down and put it with some pasta and make some you know some some pork uh, oh, there's some pork uh, lasagna or something you know so you yeah. know I'm a big fan of repurposing
So now I don't have, just for purposes of demonstration, this is a steaming basket. This is how you'd steam the wontons. I don't have it set up to cook them because you already have them cooked. But you would lay all your wontons in there and you'd have the water in the pan and you would just nice lightly steam them uh, and then you have your nice fresh wontons. So, not too difficult there, huh? Okay. I have a plate over here, but I don't have a fork. Uh oh. So I'll have to taste it. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any uh, questions so far? Oh, you have to. Everything delicious? We don't let you get away without questions. Yeah. Well, I need some questions. We got to, you know, I, I do have a couple more things to go on the seconds. demo, but otherwise, Ethan's going to have to start singing for us. <laughs> you want to sing, buddy? No, thank you. Oh, say. Why? Why are we here, Ethan, singing? How about, uh, tell us about the duck stack. What's that? Tell us about the duck stock. The duck stock? Yeah. Sure. Um, with any stock, uh, I can give you the technical, uh, the, the actual ratio recipe for stock is uh, uh, eight pounds of bones, one pound of mirepoix, which is onion, celery, and carrots, uh, to six quarts of water, because uh, that will reduce down after you cook it for a while to give you about a gallon. Uh, so if you have about eight pounds, a, um, a pound, and then eight quart, six quarts of liquid is going to give you a stock. Um, I'm a big fan of stocks and bone broths. Uh, and, and again, looking for, like for me, like I might start my dinner and, and work it completely around going to the market and finding some really beef, bean, beef bones and saying, wow, I'm going to make a nice beef stock. And then from there, what am I going to do? I don't know, but right now I'm just going to start with a really good beef stock or bone broth. You know, people are into this health thing now where bone broth is all this new craze. We've been making, chefs have been making it for hundreds of years. It's stock. You know, this is the stuff that you ate when you actually didn't have en enough food, you know, and, and you were in famine. And it was like, okay, what are you eating tonight? Well, you're going to have broth. Why? Because that's all we have. And you know what I mean? It was tight. But it was good. It was healthy. And, you know, you went through, you know, a lot of people had, you know, a lot of hardships and lived very well because they knew how to eat good food that was, you know, prepared, uh, you know, within the season or you know made for for that uh, that 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 event or that day or what they had sometimes you just have a rabbit thank goodness you have a rabbit you're going to boil that you're going to get everything out of it you're going to you know you're going to you're not going to waste any of it if you ate the meat you're going to boil the, the bones and you're going to boil them again because you know there's good energy in there and you want to get that energy and again you know I'm a big fan of you know uh, you know uh, really uh, observing our surroundings and giving it giving it homage you know when I when I pr when I produce uh, venison uh, and I shoot the deer you know, to me, it's a very personal thing. I'm really, you know, I'm taking that and I'm using it and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm making it, giving it value. I'm, I'm carrying it on and it's, it's to me, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. Ethan, do you go hunting with your dad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you enjoy that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you always enjoy learning, like, how to cook and, and prepare? Yeah. I, I like to say prepare food. It's not always necessarily. Mm -hmm. cook, cooking makes it sound so arduous and right. like yeah. a chore, but preparing yeah. food it is just, yeah, and, a lot more fun. And you know what? Sometimes I think it's good to you know, remember. Isn't that why we were, you know, what, if, what are our favorite memories? You know, sitting around and, and you know, whether you, whatever ethnicity you come from, if you're Italian, this area's got a lot of Italians, sitting around and making the ravioli and your grandmothers and aunts sitting around and making the ravioli. I know for myself, you know, my mom, uh, she would always can the tomatoes and make, uh, um, you know, make her jellies and jams and stuff like that. Right. So, you know, those are the things that you're taking that rather than, you know, put on YouTube and the kids sitting there watching things, you know, bring the family, cook dinner. It, it's not a chore. It's fun. It's, it's, it's experiencing life and talking about things and learning. And, you know, Ethan, you know, has learned a little bit today and I've learned a little bit today and you get to hang out with your kids and, and do something. So, you know, cooking doesn't, it's not a chore. It's it fun. Have to be. It's love. It's, my, it's my mom is 82 and we always made stuffed squid for um, Christmas Eve dinner and she always did it by hand with the spoon and I always mom why do you do it that way there's easier ways to do it this is the way I do it or yeah. she just did it by hand sure so I mean it's I mean she's 82 she's sure. she's not doing it anymore yeah and um so I said I'll do it she's yeah. like I, she was going to just scrap it from the menu and I said mm -hmm. you know what I'll, I'll come over we'll do it so sure I and went to the restaurant that. supply and I got the pastry bag uh -huh. And I said, you know what, I got a new toy, we're gonna have a blast, and we did. My daughters and my mom, and we were just laughing like fools. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. And just playing with the food. And if it sure. came out well, it came out well. If That's it right. didn't, do well. And if you didn't try it, right. what, do you, what, do you, what do you have to gain? Nothing, you Nothing. Know? And exactly. if it came out wrong, well, it came out, what is wrong anyway? It's just so, you know, so the omelet's not folded perfectly. It's still an omelet, it tastes good, you know? And, and rather than not try, you see, you've at least tried. How about that uh, wonton with that goat cheese mixture? Was that phenomenal? You like that? Nice little bite. I, Nice.
Thank you. I'm going to head out to the floor, and as soon as Michael asks his question, I'm going to steal I'm the curious, mic from him. I, again, going back to that duck stock, if you go through the process of making it, and I noticed that you put some of it in the cassoulet tonight, mm -hmm. sure. what other applications can be used? Well, that, that would make a very nice it. sauce. I wish that I had spoons and everybody could taste how amazing that stock is, because the flavor in that is just, you know, I, I didn't taste it. I can smell it. I know that it's just going to hit every part of my tongue. Um, that could be used as a, as a nice sauce on, on the side of a steak. Um, if you're if you're doing a steak Diane, uh, you could you know sear your steak and pick up the fond with some shallot, uh, a little bit of duck loss, some wine, cook that down, a little bit of butter, maybe monte a beurre to, to give the, the sauce a little sheen. So I mean it really you know the stocks could be especially if it's reduced down to a thick state like that can be used uh, uh, you know as its own sauce, which is really demi glace. Demi glace is a, is a reduction of stock, and so this would technically be like a duck. Gloss, a gloss oh, so we're taking notes. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. taking notes, right? Do you have any more questions? Mm -hmm. So the only okay, other thing I really have to do and talk about is the belly, uh, which is the you know most prized uh, you know part of the animal. It's the bacon. Um, you know, in fact, I'll tell you a quick little story that might freak you out because it freaked me out when I heard it in the 90s. You know, back in the 90s when I was in culinary school in college, they were talking about genetically modified foods. It, the term GMO didn't exist, but they were talking about. You know, and people didn't generally pick up on it. Of course, we're in them. I'm in the, the the top culinary school in the world or in the country at least. And you know, we were learning about a lot of things that you know people don't normally learn because, of course, it's a college, and we're 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 better. We're being taught from the you know the professors who really know what's going on. Uh, and I remember being taught back in the 90s about genetically modifications of foods and how it's going to be something that we all have to watch and it's going to be scary. And again, this is before it was a term GMO and it was on labels. Nobody knew what it was, but we were starting. To be taught like hey you guys gonna have to watch for this because what they're doing is they're taking genes and they're splicing them and they're putting different pieces of different genes uh, into different uh, products to make them different so we thought okay well what are the implications of that it's a little scary isn't it you know you're gonna take things and you're gonna change it because when you change it you change it forever you know you go back to our ancestry you know and, and you know if at one point one one person didn't you know find somebody and find them attractive and you know go over in, in Germany and and you know do their thing we'd all be different you know if they felt you know what I mean if somebody it was just thinking like how precious the beginning is, you know, to go back to your, you know, history as, a, as an Italian or France or wherever, and, and how, uh, you know, uh, uh, how we are, you know, so alive based on something that happened thousands and thousands of years ago, and that's just who we are based on that. And talking about changing our food now, and what's it going to change to down the road, I think it's a really scary thing. And one of the things that I learned was, um, and like tomatoes, now we, we eat tomatoes all, all, all winter long and they ship them from across the country all the time, Peru, wherever, you know, they're coming, these tomatoes are coming in and, you know, they don't really taste nothing like the tomatoes we have in August from the garden, but we eat them all the time and we're accustomed to it. And one of the things that they needed to make, to the, make the tomatoes actually work like that is they needed the skin to be a little bit more resilient to cold temperature. But they still have to be able to absorb the sunlight in the, in the, in the, in the field and they still had to be able to be able to be tomatoes. So they did that by taking a little salmon DNA and sniping, snipping the little spot of salmon DNA that says, hey, when we're spawning, our skin is going to resent, re, um, resent the cold temperatures of the stream, and it's going to make us live. So they take that little information and say, okay, we're going to take that little piece of information, we're going to snip it and stick it into tomatoes, and now that's there forever, and tomatoes have a different skin that, you know, quite often, you know, years ago, you would never put a tomato in the refrigerator, now they come in the refrigerator all the time. So you have salmon DNA in the, in the, uh, uh, in the tomatoes, and that's, you know, basically all the tomatoes you have have some salmon DNA in it, and we wonder why we have food allergies, right? body's all screwed up. Here's the one that really is going to freak you out. And um, w if we remember, if you remember years ago when you had bacon, you'd always have the pack and on the outside of the pack you'd see like a picture of bacon because the bacon was always very white and fatty. I mean we all remember the bacon was a lot fattier 15 or 20 years ago, which is it's, it's common, right? It's a lot leaner now, and they, really the hog is preserved and, and, and really, you know, uh, uh, you know, killed for basically the, the demand of it is the bacon because that's what drives the, the value of the pig, and, and you know, just like the chicken wings for the chickens. Um, but what you know, the piece of DNA that they put in that is actually human. 
because we are very similar to the pig. We have a very similar DNA structure and we are more um, uh, processing. We, we have a higher metabolism to actually process food. Um, you know, and we're very similar to the, to the pig. So they took that little piece and they said, okay, we're going to make you a little bit more, um, uh, um, what's the word I, was, I just said? Um, Immune? Well, humans, but uh, um, metabolize. We're going to make you metabolize the food a little bit more so that we have leaner bellies and leaner bacon. So, that, you know, there's, these are all the things that they're, you know, they're changing. And, uh, you know, some of these things are changed forever. But, you know, again, going back to my initial, initial uh, you know, talking was is to go back to the initial, the best we can, eating in season or, um, you, know, uh, per, per, you know, getting food that is real, organic, heirloom foods. Um, you know, not the factory farm stuff. And Chef, it sounds to me like you have a very close relationship, and I don't mean, I'm not being um, funny here, mm -hmm. but you have a very close relationship to nature and mm -hmm. your surroundings. And Absolutely. Certainly, a, um, as you demonstrated, a respect. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's something that I think we've all gotten away from because we're so, I think a lot of times, too, with our schedules, we're, you know, we're reliant on what we see at the grocery store or what's prepackaged in the mm -hmm. in the aisles if we could just yeah. have And our kids more aren't time. learning it. They don't know, you right. know, they just think, well, you know, strawberries are terrible, you know, like I don't know how many times, you know, if you want to go get a cantaloupe right now, it's not going to taste very good. Right. Like, you know, why eat a cantaloupe right now? It's not like it, it's terrible. It's going to taste like wood. You know, so I'd rather go to the farmers market and and pick up a really beautiful cantaloupe and say, "Now we eat cantaloupe. Tonight we're going to take cantaloupe and some cheese and that's going to be our food." We don't we I, I won't eat stews in the in the in the summertime right. because I have beautiful cantaloupe. Right, you and I, fr I freeze mine, but like, and I think mm -hmm. I just took out my last container because who wants to be eating stew in the hot weather? That you don't. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, well, I, I, just I think we're gonna get snow tonight. I heard. I don't know. <laughs> oh, great. So. <laughs> Yes, of course we will because we just cleaned off the front porch. So yeah. Of course. No. So the last thing that was on our dish is I used pork belly bacon, really, but I didn't cure it. Has a crackling. So, um, and then I, I put a little bit of brown sugar in that. Another, another shot of brandy. And Ethan is still alive. Ethan's still alive. <laughs> so, um, any questions? I don't know how much time we have. Are we? Well, I'm out on the floor, so okay. um, I was waiting for you to just finish that part of your segment up. Um, I'd like to take some questions. There has to be some questions. There was a lot going on here tonight. Awesome. We have one right over here. What does that brandy do with all that fire and everything? It's going to give you, what you're doing is you're going to take it and you're reducing down the actual essence of the alcohol and you're going to get like that basic brandy flavor. Um, the, you know, that's one thing where I see, um, you know, when, uh, a lot of times I'll see chefs with vodka, they're making a vodka sauce and they'll flame the vodka. I don't do that. I put the vodka in my tomato sauce at the very end and I want to keep that vodka there because vodka doesn't taste like anything, so what am I reducing? Um, so with vodka, if I was making a vodka sauce, I'd be making my sauce and I'd pour the vodka in at the end because I want that residual alcohol to burn through the tomato and the cream and give it a little tingle on my tongue because the alcohol is tingling and cutting through. With the brandy, um, I'm reducing it, I'm searing it, I'm, I'm, I'm flaming it off and I'm getting all that alcohol out of there because I don't want the alcohol flavor, but I do want the actual flavor of the brandy. And if you reduce it, you're going to get like that smell of the brandy. You're going to get that. It's that it's almost a cigarish type smell. So it's going to add a flavor to it. And Anyone else have a question? That's unbelievable. You know what, Chef? You were so thorough with all of that. One more question, Elaine? No? Well, that gives us a minute then to talk a little bit more about evening of fine food and wine because you're going to be part of that. Mm hmm I think my other mic is out, so I have to keep this one. I was afraid I was going to buzz. Um, so, evening of fine food and wine. Now the, you have a question. The, uh, the <laughs> stew? Uh, he's 13. He's 13. Good job, buddy. How about now? Are we good? Put it down? Okay. He said put it down. Okay. Oh, my other mic is working? Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, so evening of fine food and wine. We have Chef uh, Gary Edwards is going to be on the fourth floor up in mm -hmm. Chaplin Hall. And as I said, the other rooms uh, being the Casey Library, Ladies Parlor, um, Craftsman Hall. What am I missing? The stage. stage that's yep. a room. So everything starts off in the ballroom. We have cocktail hour and some music, and then we separate into our groups, and then we head on up to our, the, the groups break up. They go off to their um, designated areas, try those samples, and have a whole cooking demo just like this. And then we rotate from room to room to room. And we have 
Pardon me? Uh, maybe. Let's see, I know that Posh is in the Casey Library. I don't have the card in front of me. Well, oh, here I do. Yes, yeah, actually, this is even better. This is even better. I, I thought maybe a little element of surprise would be good. Yes, yeah, so we have Carmen at the Radisson's, the Colonnade, Fire and Ice on Toby Creek, which is us That's right us. here tonight, the French Manor, Hilton, and Posh at the Scranton Club. And then, of course, there's all um, other restaurants that are located in the ballroom in the beginning of the night that are going to be serving up appetizer samples. And then when we break off to our room, that all changes, and when you come back, there will be dessert. So it's a really great experience. So please make sure you, um, tickets are available at the, doc, the box office, or you can hop on our website. And we're really looking forward to seeing you there. Any more questions for Chef? Well, let's give Chef Gary Edwards and his staff. He brought his entire, his, his entire staff to help out with our volunteers to serve tonight. And his son, Ethan. Fire and ice on Toby Good job, Creek. Buddy. We all need to go down and have a great meal down there. It's a great place. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming out tonight. Awesome. Nice job. Thank you.